Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker for today, uh, Srijan Agarwal. Srijan is an associate professor at University of Alaska Fairbanks in their Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, Srijan is kind of returning home. I was really had the great pleasure of being his doctoral dissertation advisor. Uh, he started at the U of M in fall of 2007, uh, and then uh, within three and a half years, by January 2011, he had defended and graduated uh, and took 45 under, uh, graduate credits uh, all during that time. So super impressive to, to do all that with just a bachelor's degree uh, coming in. So uh, anyway, he went on and he stayed around for a little while to do some postdoc work. We had a number of projects going and I think all total, we published about a half dozen papers together during his PhD and postdoc activities. So impressive guy. I mean, even during his uh, one graduate class he took with Julian Marshall, his uh, class project turned into a paper in, in one of the top journals in our field in es and on air pollution work. So anyway, he's just a very productive guy. And he was uh, honored with the career award from National Science Foundation uh, a few years ago. And he's promoted uh, with tenure. And so this is his sabbatical year. So I'm really happy to welcome him back. So it's, it's great to be back in Minnesota and, and it's like eight years since I've been here, but it seems like a different world, uh, similar, but, but different. Uh, I think Ray introduced, but I'll quickly go through. Uh, so this is my timeline that, that Ray just talked about. I was started here in 2007 uh, when I finished my bachelor's from India and, and uh, uh, did a bit of a postdoc work and, and, and then have been in Alaska since then. And, and uh, uh, you know, being born and raised in New Delhi, India, and, and then coming to Minnesota, I guess I couldn't find a colder place. And, and uh, yeah, so got my degrees and in, in my bachelor's in India. And then uh, Minnesota was first introduction to snow. That's why I found winter here. And, and uh, that was my postdoc work in a St. Paul campus. And, and I found more winter in Alaska. And, and uh, and it's, but it's a very fun place. I, I really uh, love being there and, and working there. And uh, at least we get to have a lot of windows and <laughs> the building there is an engineering building that you can see. Uh, and, and you can actually overlook the, the Denali range and, and look at if it's a clear day, you can see from the windows, the, my office window, uh, the, the whole Denali range and, and uh, Mount Denali as well. So, yep. Right there, that's a new engineering. And, and of course, Northern Lights, Alaska is famous for Northern Lights. And, and Fairbanks is, is, this is a map that uh, the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute does a daily prediction. And you can always see Fairbanks is right in the middle of that band. Actually, just last week was an amazing like uh, auroral activity there. So anyway, so that's uh, so a little bit about Alaska. We'll talk a lot more uh, as a brief outline of my presentation. I'll, I'll, I'll provide an introduction and background to water and sanitation issues in, in rural Alaska. Uh, a lot of people I know a little bit about those, but are not fully familiar with the life out there and what it means for for day to day, you know, things like turning on a tap that we just sort of, you know, take for granted in, a, in most of the US. And, and uh, I'll present uh, some of the work, uh, I've been involved in a number of projects and some large and small projects, uh, but I selected two uh, to talk about today. Uh, one is related to energy costs for water treatment. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and this is saying treatment, but it's also like sourcing, treatment and distribution. And, and, and the, another is a willingness to pay for an in-home water reuse system. So they are both parts of larger projects and, and uh, uh, but, but let's, uh, let's see. Okay, a bit of perspective. How big is Alaska? A lot of times when you see a map of the US, either uh, this, this Alaska right here is missing or, or it's, it's like shown right like that. And you don't have a perspective of how big it is. So the correct way to show that would be something like this. You know, it, you see it, uh, it runs from the east coast to the west coast, and, and uh, the area is more than Texas, California, and Montana put together. 
So, so it's a huge, huge study, and, and, and you know, uh, just, just to give you a context of what it, uh, and then our, our university president, University of Alaska system president used to say, you know, we have campuses like all over the state and to be able to like work in, in a system like that, you know, in a continental US that would be crossing multiple state boundaries. And there are about 250 native communities and 24% and are, are uh, uh, and they're considered about 24% of the state's population. And you can see they're, they're all across the state and they're, they're distributed in the Northern region, in the interior, uh, that's where Fairbanks is, Anchorage, that's the largest city. And then Juneau here, that's the capital city in the Southeast Panhandle. And, and these are the different native regions. Uh, and then if you see here, there are some of these like, you know, community of Gamble and a little Diomede here, you can literally see Russia from there. And uh, so that's, it's true. You can see Russia from Alaska and, and, uh, uh, and you can actually see into the future because that's where the date line is, international date line. So, uh, permafrost, and, and just we'll talk a little bit about permafrost. So I just wanna give a brief introduction. Many of you must know permafrost means ground that is fully frozen, completely frozen for more than two years uh, and, and, and likely like decades and, 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 and centuries, you know, who knows? And, and, uh, so this map here shows continuous permafrost. Most of it is like this continuous permafrost in the, in the Northern region and the interior is discontinuous. And part of it is has permafrost, part of it is, doesn't have permafrost. And then of course, you know, the Southern and the South Central is more sporadic permafrost. And, and of course, there's the Southeast Panhandle, Juno doesn't, doesn't have any permafrost. It's, it's more like a, it's a rainforest, and and uh, um, yeah, and, and that's it makes it really hard for con construction and all other civil engineering activities uh, in the in the state. Um, in fact, uh, if you go to Alaska and start practicing engineering there, regardless of your PE status in other states, you need to take a, a, a special course called Arctic Engineering because uh, lots of people have come to Alaska and you know, have, have done things that were not expected. So some of the logical, logistical challenges when we talk of water and sanitation in, in, in rural Alaska, uh, I, I mentioned permafrost conditions and permafrost, uh, you know, it invariably it leads to instable, unstable infrastructure like pipelines. If you bury them, you know, there's, if there is a, a permafrost thaw and, you know, it, it can, lead to moving parts and pieces, which is never good. And, and uh, so that's why a lot of communities resort to these above ground like piping systems, which, you know, uh, it can really like, some of them are like right across the community. You have to like build certain bridges to go over them and, 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 and that, that they have their own challenges. And um, uh, there's access uh, is logistically difficult. Uh, Alaska is huge. and there's not a huge road network. So most of these communities you saw on the map are off the road communities and can only be accessed by uh, air or, or via barge. And, and, uh, and so that's, that makes it uh, difficult to transport, let's say building material or other stuff. And soils are not amenable to bury pipes and do other construction activities. A lot of times soil has to be transported in, which is, which can be used for construction and very expensive to build and operate water systems, uh, multiple reasons. And, you know, and some are like, you have to keep the water circulating to, to you know, keep it from being frozen and, and uh, heated water, adding heat, adding circulation. So there are like an outlet and there are an inlet coming to the pump house. And, and so, or, or some communities, maybe not so many, also let the water bleed just to, you know, let it keep running. Uh, and then some, some of them have to transport water sewage long distances from the central locations. And, and these are some snippets of, of uh, pictures, me and my collaborators, we have 
from different projects. And, and these are showing like a watering point. A lot of communities have a central washed area uh, where they can do you know, laundry showering and, and get water. And, and a lot of them collect ice and, and just use meltwater or rainwater. Uh, a lot of communities which are unserved don't have pipes. They use these honey buckets and, and manually carry the waste and, and uh, or, or in uh, these four wheelers uh, and, and dispose them in, in lagoons. Um, a short video. This is produced by the state of Alaska. Let me, hopefully this will work. The audio will work as well, I think. Villages in Alaska are a world away. In the farthest corners of the largest state in the nation, there are vibrant communities. Most of Alaska's 280 communities can only be reached by air or water. Despite advances in rural Alaska over the years, thousands of homes lack running water and sewer. Residents from these villages haul drinking water from central watering points or drink water from untreated sources, such as creeks, rivers, melted snow, or rainwater collected in garbage cans. Many Alaskans use five gallon buckets to collect, transport, and dispose of human waste into nearby sewage lagoons or tundra ponds. When transporting these buckets by hand or in cars, human waste spills on paths, roads, or boardwalks, exposing residents, and children in particular, to health risks. We investigated the health of rural Alaskans living with and without running water. And we found that children living in homes that didn't have running water were 10 times more likely to have viral pneumonia, severe bacterial infections, or skin infections. Adults also living without running water were more likely to have pneumonia and influenza and skin infections like boils. So we think that getting adequate volumes of running water in households will have an effect on decreasing these high rates of infectious diseases in rural Alaska homes. To correct this public health problem, agencies have funded conventional, community-wide, piped and truck haul systems. Now many of these systems are aging and deteriorating. Funding to build these systems has declined severely, while costs have risen sharply, and there are still 22% of rural Alaska homes that lack running water and a flush toilet. So that's, uh, I don't know if over Zoom you could hear the audio, but uh, it's a, a publicly available video from produced by the state of Alaska. If you search for Alaska Water and Sewer Challenge, you should be able to find it. To many Americans, Oops. remote villages in Alaska are a world away. But even in the farthest corners of the largest state in the Sorry for that. Okay. So, uh, some of these were alluded to in that in that short video snippet. Uh, types of water and sanitation services in rural Alaska. These are like broad categories. There are some subcategories as well. Uh, you have pipe systems which provide water directly to homes through through conventional uh, and centralized uh, systems in, in communities. Uh, then there are closed hall. Closed hall could be like a small or large small and uh, small like trailers pulled by four wheelers or snow machines or there are truck halls which are some in some larger communities but it also depends on the the soil conditions available for for transporting heavy heavy equipment and vehicle uh, then washed areas are centralized facilities for obtaining treated water uh, showering and doing laundry so it's a lot of communities have these central washed areas where basically you go and do all water related things uh, and, and bring in water into your home. Uh, some of them are piped, some of them are not piped. And then there's self hall uh, where uh, residents haul the water, store it in their homes and, and uh, they haul the sewage as well. Uh, and these self hall communities are called the unserved communities. And, and a lot of the focus has been on these unserved communities and, and uh, unserved homes and unserved communities. So as, as I said, an unserved home is one which has no connection uh, to an on-site or a community pipe or a closed hall system. And uh, uh, an unserved community has, if there are more than 45% of homes that are unserved, then that community is classified as unserved community. And there are about 31 unserved uh, 
uh, communities uh, are the 250, uh, 250 odd communities. So these, these are some graphs that show uh, there are about 6,000 unserved homes. And, and of those, uh, some are like about 70% are in unserved communities, but even in communities that are served, uh, there could be homes that are, that are not served. So, and, and uh, there are, again, further breaking it down into those 6,000 into unserviceable, meaning that you can't have, there's, it's not feasible to build septic and wells, and they're far from the core community to provide services. And then there's some are funded, but not yet connected, and some are neither funded uh, nor connected. And, and I should mention that this data is a bit dated, and, and uh, but uh, the numbers could be a little different today. And cost and budget needs, and then this is again from, from the DEC estimates back in 2012. Uh, and and uh, you can see sort of the, the widening gap between the available funding and the, and the projected costs. Uh, and I've been having some conversations, you know, there's a lot of hope from the, uh, from a new infrastructure plan that that would mean a lot of things for, that could mean a lot of things for these, these places like these. Uh, and this is further, uh, the y-axis here shows the water and wastewater costs, the fee, monthly fee as a, as a percentage of this MHI is monthly household income. And, and these uh, here, these are, communities in, in uh, these are the rural communities here. And these are the larger cities, Juneau, Anchorage, Sitka, Palmer. And, and this green line is the lower 48 average. And red line is what the EPA recommended sustainability threshold. So you can see that's about 5%. And, and the, the lower 48 is like what people refer to as the continental US uh, in Alaska. And, and so, but a lot of these communities are much higher than the national average uh, or the lower 48 average and the urban areas in, in Alaska and also the EPA recommended threshold. Just a second, I think there's an extra slide here. Yeah, so observed water use in Alaska, uh, cell fall, these are the unserved communities, the per capita per day use of water is one to five gallons. And, and if you compare that with drugged hall or the closed hall, uh, that, that's about five to 30. And then the pipe is 40 to 60 gallons per capita per day. And, and uh, estimates for national averages are, are very widely, but 100 to 200 gallons per person per day or, or even more in some places. And then the WHO recommendations, 1.3 gallons is is considered inadequate access with very high levels of concern and at least 13.2, which is 50 liters per, gal per person per day is considered uh, you know, intermediate or access. And, and so you can see really low numbers and, and the picture there. Uh, so there are 80% of participating households in a recent study, they, in, in two remote and unserved communities, they found that the households reported using the wash basin, the bathroom sink water, an average of three times before changing the water. And, and that's uh, common in many, many communities. And it's all linked, you know, it's, there's, it's very hard to get water into your home. You have to haul it. So you're careful of how you use it. And, and it's, it's very expensive. And, and that leads to, you know, much, much higher rates of, uh, infection and, and skin infections and, and other, other diseases. Uh, and we, we wrote a perspective article on, on potential impacts of these existing inequities in water and, and sanitation on, on you know, things like COVID, you know, but these were to exacerbate the impacts of um, in these circumstances. Okay, so moving on to the first uh, study that I'm gonna talk about uh, energy cost for water treatment. And, and uh, uh, just highlighting some of the collaborators here and the students working on this. And, and this is in collaboration with ANPHC, which stands for Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. 
and and they uh, they worked with a lot of communities in uh, in, in areas of public health, and, and of course water is one of them, uh, and and the funding support for this uh, largely came from an NSF project. NSF had this infuse full energy water initiative uh, sometime back, so this was an infuse project, uh, a much larger project. Uh, this is the larger project team. Uh, with the community members, with people from other engineering, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and, and uh, different campuses and, and even uh, Canadian collaborators. So as a part of this larger project, this, we did this study uh, with the objectives of trying to understand the energy used for water treatment and distribution throughout the different regions in Alaska and evaluate the variation of energy use with seasons and regions and and types of water systems, and and uh, yeah, and it it seems kind of very basic, but there are no reports of like how much water you know how much energy it takes uh, in Alaska for for these things. And so the the 70th communities were distributed across the state, uh, and uh, it's really hard to get data. It's really hard to get to these communities without this of getting data. And, and, and a lot of this, most of this data came from ANTHC. They have been doing energy audits over a number of years. And, and you know, they were all strewn across different platforms, different uh, online sources or different, uh, you know, uh, repositories. And, and uh, so what it meant was collating all that data, bringing it to the same sort of a framework. Uh, and, and I'll talk more about this, but just wanted to give you an idea of variation of population in these 78 communities uh, grouped by the regions southwest. And, and, and maybe I should highlight in this map here, you can see there's a northern region here and the interior, uh, the southwest, the Gulf Coast communities here and the southeast. Uh, and, and you can see the interior are smaller communities in the interior and, and a uh, little bit larger, but smaller and larger. They're all hundreds of people you can see, or less. And and this sort of the framework of like what we did here, like in a very brief way, ANTHC energy data, and uh, and and that was combined with electric uh, electricity use, the diesel oil in gallons, and the recovered heat that was used, wood use, and the solar energy, and and then. And, and many of them were like also connected. We were just we just wanted to look at the water the treatment and distribution. So there were like some times they were clubbed with the sewage pumping, for example. So we had to tease all of that apart, and 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 they were month by month uh, strewn over ten years. So it's a lot of like months and months. Of, at least I think a year of data wrangling to get it all in a uh, format that you could look at. Uh, and and then we got into per capita total energy, and and had to bring in some other data sets of population estimates also looking at temperature estimates. Uh, and then we looked at different uh, factors that may impact energy use. So this is just to give you the, like, <laughs> I don't expect you to read the exacts, but all the different communities that were like there in this study, if you look grouped by population. One sort of a rough trend that you see here is, if you see these population numbers are, uh, pointer. So getting larger as you go towards the right. And, and so the communities which have more population are, are, are their annual per capita total energy in kilowatt hour is, is lower. So there, there seems to be some economies of scale working here, uh, which is expected. And this is the same data, just a little bit more uh, grouped rather than it showing individual communities uh, and, and you can see the y-axis is important. I'll show you why. I mean, it's thousands of kilowatt hours per person uh, per year. And, and if you look at the literature in this thing, very hard to find, like most of the data is in terms of kilowatt hour per meter cube or per gallon. And so it's, it's hard to make a comparison or, or, or in, in, because of that. And, and the issue here, here is we couldn't really translate to that metric because it's very hard to measure or get the data for water use or water production in these communities. Uh, but the energy data has been, has been very well tracked by ANTHC. 
And so there's that economy of scale I was talking about. And, but if you draw a line, average line, uh, that's about 1100 odd kilowatt hour per person per year. And then, and, and we made estimates of the continental US average. That's about, you know, four times lower, almost three or four times lower, ranging from three, around 300 to 400 uh, kilowatt hour per person per year. And so to put that into further perspective, so three to four times higher energy requirements, kilowatt hour per person per year in rural Alaska. And then the energy costs themselves are another factor of three to five times higher. So that means about 10 to times higher water costs in rural Alaska. And, and you know, people have always said, you know, that it costs more, to, to, you know, but, but to get these numbers, it's, it's, I think it's something that uh, it would be, uh, and we are still working on this publication and, and getting this to out. And, and ANT is very interested in this data for, for obvious reasons. They want to look at communities where the need is higher, they can prioritize their efforts. And, and, and also uh, communities are interested in this work because you know, they're, they're right for a lot of these federal grants to get money to work on their water systems. And they need to explain to people why they need it. You know? and, and so we hope some of this would uh, help bridge that knowledge gap. And, and there is not, literally in the literature, there is no data for these things uh, in Alaska. And even nationally, energy for water is a metric that's not been very uh, well tracked. And if you group by region, then you see that uh, interior tends to be higher than northern and others. We would, we would have expected northern to be higher because it's just because it's colder. And, and, but it seems that spark of it is to do with, as I mentioned, interior communities were smaller size communities and these are per capita numbers. So it's so probably a bit of that is factoring in here. And so these smaller communities in the interior and the temperatures, not as cold maybe as Northern, but, but you know, much, much colder than the other places. And, and that's why those seem to have higher energy use. And uh, this one is a little busy plot, but I'll break it down. Again, grouped by region, but now looking at monthly on the Y axis, just seeing if there are like a temporal trend. And then this is a, pretty uh, well expected trend that you see lower energy needs in the summer months and then and, and higher in the winter months. And, but again, the, those trends still showing up. And now looking by water system, as I mentioned, there are different kind of water systems. So uh, the wells, the closed hall, the wash it areas, but the pipes circulating where you have to keep circulating the water and add heat. And, and those seem, you know, that for obvious reason that seems to be uh, more energy consuming. So some of the take home points from this analysis, and there are a lot of, lot of parts and pieces that have not uh, presented here. It's, it's we are also running like models and correlations with temperature and, and something called heating degree days. And, and, and there are a lot of lots of different or even like monthly household income. And, uh, but what we can see is that costs for rural water withdrawal, treatment and distribution are a magnitude, uh, an order of magnitude higher, sorry, that should be order of magnitude, higher than national average costs. And, and there appear to be economies of scale, which are driving up the costs even higher for smaller communities. So that factor of 10 to 20 may mean even more that, that for other communities, which are smaller, and interior Alaska has higher energy needs for water. And, and then the pipes or plating systems are more energy expensive. So uh, moving on to the next study, the willingness to pay for water in-home water reuse. And um, this again, just, just showing uh, the collaborators here. This, is, this was led by Aaron Dotson, who is uh, sort of my counterpart at uh, University of Alaska Anchorage. He's an environmental engineering faculty there and, and a public health faculty, Elizabeth Hodges Snyder and, and two graduate students, Kara Lucas was Aaron's student and, and Barbara Johnson is a PhD student at UAF. Um, and this was also partly supported by the National Science Foundation, but most of the, the project was the whole, it's a 
larger a, a, a part of the Alaska Water and Sewer Challenge uh, that was supported by the state of Alaska DEC and, and also the EPA. And this was recently published in ESNT Water. Uh, okay, a little bit of background. Uh, centralized versus decentralized systems. Uh, many of you must be aware of what they are, but just a brief intro. In a centralized system, we have like a huge community water system where water is treated and stored in, in say water tanks and, and then distributed to homes and, and uh, uh, industries in, in, the, in the local area. And then the decentralized systems are where instead of treating the water at, at a centralized location, uh, it's either treated at a point of entry or at the point of use in the home. And, and so, so these are like, again, what centralized systems would look like in, in Alaska. And it's, it's, you can see it's, it has its challenges. And, and uh, this is a picture of the system that uh, Aaron and his team at UAA uh, built uh, in, a, in a, the trailer here. And uh, I'll, I'll describe briefly the system and, and Aaron has done a lot of presentations on them and, and that, on that system. I won't go into a lot of details of the system itself, uh, and as I said, it's part of the Alaska Water and Sewer Challenge. And, and that's the video actually I played, which is available on this website. Uh, and so in 2012, 2013, the state of Alaska launched this Alaska Water and Sewer Challenge uh, as a quest for the perfect system, uh, which would be decentralized and in-home uh, and, uh, and to be able to do like a really good job on treating the water. Uh, there were like lots of teams invited in, like internationally. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so I think there are three teams that, were, that made it to the third, second or third round. And, and uh, this system that we'll talk about is, is in a pilot, piloting stage right now. So this was the Alaska Water and Sewer Challenge. Uh, just briefly, the, the state wanted increased quantity of water in the home that would potentially lead to more water use. Uh, On-site treatment, which should provide 400 gallons of water weekly for a family of four, and it could reuse, the system could reuse gray water and sink water from the home, uh, gray water and kitchen sink water, and minimize the water volume that must be self-hauled. So they put like a limit of 30 gallon of water in weekly and 30 water, 30 gallons out. And separate drink, drinking water is separate and, and uh, the reuse water is wash water quality and intended to be for wash water, but not for consumption. And, and there were different iterations of this system that were built at UAA. And, uh, and this is the, uh, the system that was built. There's a hot water heater, there's sinks and there's shower and, and uh, uh, and there are like these small fixture, fixture associated uh, tank water heaters. And, and then there were like a lot of these went into like there were cultural considerations and that's what this study is gonna look at. For example, disinfection, uh, most of the uh, rural community members dislike chlorination. So the, the, the disinfectant of choice was UV. Uh, and uh, and the drinking water separates were the drinking water faucets were separate. This is as you can see, and there was a drinking water tank here with UV disinfection and a one micron filter. And the water was sourced in the communities, either from rainwater or surface water or treated washeteria water even. And that would factor into like uh, costs as well because uh, you could potentially get surface water or ice melt water for free versus you need to pay for the water from the wash area. So SANIFOAM, uh, so this, this study took a SANIFOAM focus. SANIFOAM stands for sanitation uh, uh, and, and with the emphasis on focus, opportunity, ability, motivation. It's a conceptual framework and, and uh, which is designed to answer sanitation behavior questions uh, because, you know, uh, as, as a lot of us understand, just building infrastructure in places like these is, isn't enough. Uh, there has to be a change in sanitation behavior. There, have, there, there has to be cultural acceptance 
there has to be ownership. Uh, and and uh, so the more effective strategy is changing behavior of the people and providing facilities and services. But before the behavior can be changed, you must understand it. And so here, willingness to pay is measured as a motivational behavior determinant. It's, it's different from ability to pay. And, and uh, willingness to pay for upgrading the sanitation conditions, it, it, de it demonstrates the community's readiness or, or to, to change or to adapt to a new technology. And, and this was used as a way to uh, understand community's desires and, and, and whether the water reuse system would even be wanted. And, and because that, that was part of the whole water and, sanit the, the water and sewer challenge that the state had launched. And uh, it, it, it included like going to the communities, talking to the community members, hey, what do you want? What do you want in a water system? We just don't wanna build something that is just, we wanna build it. It's, you know, your water system, what would you want? And, and so this was the timeline. So in spring 2015, uh, the, the team visited two Alaska rural villages for community meetings regarding water reuse. It's so like, what are the perceptions of water reuse? Are people, you know, uh, what do they think about it? And, and these were just community discussions. There were no formal data collection at this time. And then spring 2016, a water reuse prototype, keeping in mind the input that the communities had, for example, you know, chlorine versus no chlorine. And, and uh, that was built uh, based on the community feedback in phase one. And, and then in phase two, uh, the households were surveyed for willingness to pay in, in those villages. And, um, um, and then I'll go through this, but, but, the, but the, this was done in a specific way, this interview process. Uh, let's see. The communities were presented or each household was presented with a set of questions like, or like these are the different pictures that can be there in the, in the, in the uh, water system, like a shower or a kitchen sink or a bathroom sink, and what would you want? You know? So they could go on off and select, hey, I want this, 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 and then uh, you would give them, hey, it will cost per month this number. And then they could say, okay, I accept it, you know, that that seems okay to me. And, and then that, that the survey ends at that point. Or they could say, you know, uh, no, this, this doesn't seem right to me. Uh, I don't think uh, I, I, I can pay this. And so we will do a second iteration. And this time we sort of like turn the computer around and, and say, okay, let's work it out together. So this thing costs this, this thing costs this, this picture costs that. And then they would do a second iteration and then come up with a second cost number. And then again, they had the option of, okay, yeah, I, this, this, this looks okay, or this doesn't look okay. So that was how this, this whole thing was done. And this was done in two communities, uh, one in the YK Delta region, uh, which is here. This is the Southwest region and one in interior Alaska and, and uh, one had 100 households, one had 40 households, and we are not like using specific community names for IRB purposes. Uh, and these are some pictures from our visits and, and uh, you can see subsistence lifestyle. These are boardwalks that are pretty common in these, in, in many of the communities. And, and these are the, this, the sewage collection. In, and, and these are again, central watering points and, and uh, aircrafts coming in and, and dirt roads and, and outhouses. And, uh, and so the research objectives and hypothesis for this study, um, so develop a decision-making tool to, for use in unserved rural Alaskan communities. And, and I should mention both of these communities were unserved communities and use a multidisciplinary approach to evaluate the desire, practicability and willingness to pay for a water reuse system. And the hypothesis is, is the amount the homeowners are willing to pay for in-home water supply will differ from costs based on the desired fixtures. So the questions we were looking at, how does the water source selection affect willingness to pay? What fixtures are desired? When does the system cost become too much? And then the state wanted uh, that the average cost uh, is a $135 limit, like a monthly fee should be a $135 
and, and how do the different communities compare? And there is a cooperative fee of $40. Uh, is that an accepted cost? And this is the sort of the Excel file, the tool that was this a survey instrument that was created. And, and, uh, and yeah, of course it went through all the IRB processes and everything. Uh, and in the first round, they just selected the fixture. They did not see these calculations. And if they, if they went for a second iteration, then the other said the computer would turn and they would work along with the interviewer. These are some of the images of people being interviewed. And, and uh, uh, basically, you know, one of the team members would go into the house and say, ask if the head of the household was there and, and what, uh, had, the, had some fires of what we were trying to do and, and present the questionnaires and if that was the right time to talk to them. And, and yeah, and, and a lot of times it's a lot of, you know, listening and, and, and you know, and, and these are the res results, excuse me, from, from these interviews. Uh, so total households 30 in one of the communities and 11 in another, uh, and, and almost 50% accepted the first cost estimates uh, in the first community in the YK community and, and most accepted the second cost. And so overall, like, I mean, in both the communities, almost everybody ultimately accepted some level of costs. So that was good, that indicated the willingness to pay or, or some desires for these systems. And, and now if you look at different fixtures, it's a, it's a kind of a busy plot, but let's uh, break it down. So this is the first iteration and this is the second iteration for the YK community and, and dry toilets, you know, so they were the, the consistently desired uh, and, and this declined is showing in this, this orange here. So the, the shower was declined uh, in the second and the first rounds, but if you see in the interior community, uh, it was not declined. And, and a part of it could be due to, you know, uh, I think this community had a wash it area. So people were like, I, I can just use the wash it area for that and, and keep my costs low. And then the bathroom sink, uh, again, uh, it, it seems the desire for the bathroom sink was consistent. And so was for a kitchen sink. But then the laundry machine again differed and, and almost, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people declining the, the laundry machine. And, and, and again, probably they have laundry machines, laundry facilities in a different place in the community or other reasons. So, so, so there was a bit of a variation there. So it could be either. And, and these are the accepted survey costs. So you can see these are, uh, and these are rejected. They were higher, so they were rejected. And then they became lower in the second survey costs. And again, they were lower, but this is the sort of the number to look at the all accepted costs. And, and the average there was a hundred dollar per month of ex first and second accepted costs. And, uh, uh, and that was well below the state's limit of dollar one thirty-five. And one thing uh, that didn't reflect here in the results was the dollar forty cooperative the community cooperative fee was something that was uh, disliked in in, in most uh, households. So some of the conclusions from this work: there is overall a strong support for in-home water reuse, and 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 people were really you know interested. And, and community desires for in-home water or sewer uh, were for most part more than what they believe they can afford. And, and uh, we saw some regional differences, of course, it was only two communities. Uh, and then recognition of the need for the on-site systems to be flexible, to allow homeowners to select what they you know, would want to include in their lifestyle and, and uh, and it seems that the unserved communities may be best served with limited fixtures. You don't want to provide the whole thing, you know. Uh, and and uh, but, but overall, there was a demonstration of willingness to pay. And and there are some recommendations. There's I didn't talk about it. There's like a, there's a pass system, which is uh, uh, another sanitation system that that ANTHC has developed and piloted in many different communities. And uh, that would complement what the YK survey estimated households were willing to pay. And, and the not all homes need full water service. 
and, and future in-home water systems, they have to be adaptive to household needs. Uh, so overall, this, this highlights the importance of having conversations and it, this being like a two-way process, a collaborative process, uh, more like what like, I think NSF calls nowadays convergent research or, or community-based research. And then this is very, very more uh, important in, in rural Alaska. So I think this is my final slide. Uh, and, and overall, I think uh, uh, from these two projects, I was, I was debating, I had like more data, but probably not enough time to present that from other projects and from these projects. But, but you can kind of see, get a flavor of what are the different challenges and different uh, sort of issues in, in rural Alaska for water, uh, water sourcing, water treatment, water distribution. And, and then uh, I also had some data from one of our recent uh, project funded by the National Science Foundation as well looking at the uh, water quality in, in uh, remote parts of the state and, and glaciers and, and permafrost and because that's what is feeding into these communities. Uh, but with that, I will stop and, and uh, open the floor for questions. I really enjoyed it. I, I was wondering, um, this is beyond what you spoke about, but but I know you've done a lot of research in this area, so maybe you can reply. But um, I wonder when people talk about these um, distributed reuse systems, how much um, maintenance and, and willing to maintain a system is taken into account? Because I know, you know, a lot of people here in highly developed, very wealthy areas have, um, you know, the, the activated carbon filter on their water and, and they never bother to change them. And then they become, you know, breeding grounds for loads of bacteria. Right. And so, yeah. so I wondered, you know, if, if you're dealing with a community that is um, underserved or unserved, do you know if they have a higher willingness and aptitude for uh, maintenance or a lower one, and and is that being factored into the risk calculation with respect to public health? Yeah, thanks, Dave. That's a really good question. Uh, yeah, so, so one philosophy, you know, is, is uh, the, the KISS philosophy: keep it simple, stupid. You know, so that was sort of factored in by most of the teams. You know, you can like design this thing that nobody can understand what's happening there or, or get the parts for. Uh, but having said that, you know, there is still, as you said, like even something like changing your filter is, is a level of maintenance that's needed and required. And, and uh, something I did not mention, but another like a larger issue in rural communities is lack of skilled labor or, or water plant operators. Uh, and, and that's where the monthly cooperative fee sort of comes in that would try to help maintain these, these systems. And, and, uh, and, and there have been like a lot of different conversations I've, I've had with people and heard, you know, while, while the decentralized systems are really have their advantages and, and you know, but the people really like, you know, to have just without any concern, like turn on the tap, you know, so there's always this, uh, you know, desire for piped systems, which are more centrally, uh, but then, you know, it's, it's uh, so, so yeah, that's a big concern. And, and, and especially for the, the system I showed, it, it probably has some elements uh, that, that uh, may not be amenable for that. And, and but these are very really you know, it's a strong consideration in, in final implementation and success of a system. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm a structural engineer, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, when you looked at your energy calculations, is that just pure energy like that your these components are using, or do you also factor in like the transportation costs and things of that nature if someone has to haul stuff? Um, or like their their energy, I guess. Yeah, so when we talk of energy costs, it, it, I think it, it includes like a water treatment location, the heating, uh, pumping, lighting, and, and you know, all of those costs. And, and, and in some cases, when you're talking of haul, the diesel required for the, the, the haul, you know, and, and yeah. So John, I, just a quick question, I'm, I'm ignorant of, you know, groundwater in Alaska. Is there no groundwater, or is like I, I was just wondering about that. Like, are there no wells anywhere, or, or maybe just in southern Alaska? Could you just comment on the availability of groundwater resources? 
there are wells. There are, uh, in fact, many of the communities that they have wells. But again, as you as you sort of said, you know, they're because of permafrost and and and, the, and, and frozen ground, and it's not as uh, as in in all the communities, it's not easily accessible groundwater. It seems like the 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 problem of water is one of the many problems in the houses there. Is there any effort ongoing uh, to design uh, a modular house uh, that would work uh, in such a climate, something like where you make sure that there's no energy dissipation and, and everything like, it seems like an integrated yep. house would, would yeah. could be designed and for this harsh condition. Right, right. So uh, there is a cold climate housing research center which is not a part of UAF, but just right next to UAF, and and uh, and and that does exactly what you were saying. You know, it builds model houses, and and, and Fairbanks is sort of an Arctic community itself, but not remote uh, or, or, or a rural community. But so they do a lot of pilot testing, and they have also been involved in many efforts like these. And in fact, I think their team also competed, but did not advance to one of the final stages. So so yes, there are there. I would say always there are like more problems or, or, you know, things to work on than people in Alaska. A lot of our graduates, like all of our graduates, engineering graduates, they graduate and they get jobs, you know. And, and uh, in terms of people doing research on these things, there's always more need than there are people. But yes, there are uh, CCHRC, Coal Climate Housing Research Center, is, an, is a, now it's a part of a DOE lab and, and, and federally funded. Uh, they are doing a lot of great work in this area. And yes, you're right. This needs to be; these systems need to be integrated on a larger uh, infrastructure level. Thanks. One other quick question: uh, like that system that you showed, uh, the gray water recycling. I mean, has that got RO, UV disinfection? I mean, I don't know. I didn't see all the components, but. I mean, what are you talking about per household to set something like that up? I, I think that system has like, a, it has a few cartridge filters and a, and a couple of cartridge filters and the reverse osmosis filter and, and then a UV. And, and I think there's a, a ozonation there too. O ozonation too. Yeah, and do you know the cost per, per installation? The cost of the whole system, I think they're, uh, they have it in the paper. It's about, uh, and it's just under the rec state's recommendation of about, Hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which includes like everything, and and that you know that a reviewer in the paper came back and said that seemed like exorbitant. You know, the state is funding a lot of that, and if you look at the other alternatives the state had, uh, it still seems to be much cheaper than uh, other alternatives. And did you say a hundred and fifty thousand yes. dollars? And that would be a single home installation. Single home. Wow. Yes. Okay. It's on the order of that. I could be like. And then, what's the annual O and M on something like that? Do you know the annual O and M operations and maintenance costs on something like that? So that's not that's not is it or is that that's included? The capital costs. Those are the capital. That's just capital. Yes. Yes. So O so and M, you know, there's there's again some state support, but then uh, uh, that's what these are supposed to be. These interviews are conducted for the user fee and the cooperative fee, and okay. and tend to be sort of you know, uh, self-maintaining systems. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Okay. All right. I guess any any online questions? Okay. All right. Oh, one more. Sorry. Thank you, Sergeant, for the nice talk. It must be really hard to study these areas to get the data. Um, I just have a quick question about you made the list of different type of energy consumptions when you do the energy calculation and the cost calculation. Um, I wonder if there's room. I was I just looked up like Alaska is also uh, the economy is they're exporting oils and natural gas. I wonder if there is so any room for improvement of cost for water. Any related needs can be made by changing their energy source if the oil is really cheap there or things like that. Yeah, it's it's yeah, thanks, Boya. It's uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Alaska produces a lot of oil. And and you know and this this Alaska the the, uh, the Great Alaska Pipeline you know you've all heard about it, but then uh, it doesn't mean that oil is cheaper in Alaska or, or or gas is cheaper in Alaska. It all is supplied as you know it's in a crude form and then and then refined and and then the the costs uh, uh, like are are I think they are determined by more more factors than than just you know the production in Alaska. 
Uh, now, having said that, there's this uh, thing called the, uh, the permanent dividend fund, which is the, so there are no state taxes in Alaska. In fact, there's a permanent dividend fund, which is based on these oil leases, and, and uh, that goes into a central pot of money for, for in, in the state. And every resident of the state in rural or urban areas, they get like a, every year a, a, a check, uh, you know, it could be $1,000 or $2,000. It's called the permanent fund dividend. And, and that's sort of the oil money that comes back to the people of the state. And I think that's, that's I think, one prominent way that it shows up. But, but in terms of, you know, just that because you're producing oil, it will be cheap there. That's, uh, that's not true. That's, in fact, sometimes it's more expensive. Okay, let's thank Sujan. Thank you.